Welcome to Modcast, a civilization podcast focused on game modding. Rob R8XFT. T Pangolin. Jan Baruta. Alpha Shard. <laughs> hey there guys, my name is Jet, also known as T-Pangolin, and welcome back to episode number 56 of City Skylines Cast. I mean, Modcast, the Civilization 5 podcast where we discuss mods and future sacrifices to our glorious god Nebuchadnezzar and our saviour, JFD. Joining us on the panel today is... Jan Boruta. Rob R8 XFT. Arthur Shard. Sukadex. I think one of the problems with modding, and this goes back to even Civ 2, is there's certain people that just want to rush it out, get it out there so they get feedback, but it's all unfinished and it's tarnished. Uh, Guilty as charged. Yeah. Well, I I wasn't thinking so much of you really there because, you know, (laughs) uploaded a complete thing, but people who'd maybe do some artwork that they've done in about five minutes and and just upload it just so they could get some feedback and some contact with somebody online is just uh, Mm. crazy, really. Joining us on the panel today, we are very lucky to have the illustrious and very well-known modder of Sucratact, whose mods have very, very wide playability. Is that even, am I even saying that right? What I'm trying to say is these what uh, mods have a very widespread and lots of people play them. Like, the only reason you're probably listening to this cast is because it has his name on it. <laughs> we just... Uh... <laughs> Who exactly are you, Sucratar? What are you? Uh, I'm human. Do that to, to know. I'm a modder from Thailand. A modder and an artist, actually. Traditionally known so- as a martist. Martist? <laughs> <laughs> that almost sounds like a martyr. Um, yeah. <laughs> you may know me for either my sibs or the events and decisions mod, I suppose. More likely the events and decisions mod because that thing is big. We weren't lying about the scope. Events and Decisions is one of those mods that just so many people play, and it's now pretty much an integral part, um, much like people consider Advanced User Interface or Info Addict as an integral part of Civ Five. so congratulations on that front. Something that makes the base game feel so worthless <laughs> without... <laughs> I think one of your first top moments of Critat was releasing the Lorenzo Di Medici uh, artwork on April Fool's Day and having <laughs> the community think that that was going to be in the, the actual Braxis version. Oh, yeah, that was fantastic. Bit of a background. In the Brave New World, in the release, there was a 500-page thread or something ridiculous on like um, like that on the Sifanatic's general discussion page, and then Sucratac released some artwork for Lorenzo di Medici saying that Italy was going to be one of the sieves in Brave New World, and a lot of people bought it. A lot of people absolutely bought it. Me included. Oh, yeah, me, like, me, me as well, because Italy was also one of the front runners that people were considering to get into the game. Like, we ended up getting Venice and Shoshone, but um, there was only two sieves down, and Italy was definitely one of the sieves that people were thinking to get into the game. And that art looked very similar to the way that Firaxis does their art as well, so... <laughs> oh, but wasn't Venice released last? So, um, yeah. Yeah, so Secret Attack wasn't very far off from yeah, no, guessing yeah, the sieve. Yeah. I think it got called out on the eyebrows. I forgot to put my eyebrows when I posted it on Naval Fool's thing. <laughs> <laughs> just say it was, that was just a trend back in the Renaissance. <laughs> I did put it in when I actually released Tuscany, but <laughs> I was like, oh dear, I forgot to put in eyebrows. <laughs> I'd love to see that update slash change log now contains eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff of legends. <laughs> what sort of got you into modding? What's your history behind you actually getting to Civ and then making the step into actually going into modding? When I started modding with just Wonders, I think I saw Ambrox's Wonders and I really wanted to make my own, so I start, I just made an icon in Photoshop for the Abu Simbel. At the time, I didn't have the SDK, so I just copied the code for the Moai statues and just edited it in Notepad. Not even Notepad Plus, just the basic Notepad that comes with. <laughs> <laughs> the PC, yeah. you know, that, that was horrible. That's but, my main modding tool. <laughs> but it came up really nice, and that was my first mod. And then Hawkeye contacted me asked me to make icons for his wonders, so then I just stopped modding for a really long time and just did art. Until Tuscany. 
after Brave New World was released and there was no Italy, there was Venice, but none of the other Italian states, I really wanted Tuscany in the game. The only thing I knew was XML and art. So I went and contacted Putmalk because I've done icons for him at the time. So I asked him for a favor and asked him to teach me how to do code in Lua. I learned that and I coded up everything else. And I got my first civilization mod, Tuscany. A lot of first civilization releases, you can see how modders grow over time and just how depth some people get. And they usually go back and update their original civilizations to the level of what their current civilizations are like. But when Tuscany was first released, it both had really, really good art. The design was really nice. And I don't think there were any major bugs in it at all. Really fantastic solid Civ and one that rightfully deserved to be in the game. Yeah, well, what helped is I think that Secret Act already matured as an artist for Civilization and uh, Tuscany had a very good presentation. It got a fair share of well-earned publicity in the beginning and I still enjoy having Tuscany. Very, very fun for um, defensive um, culture wonder whoring, which is the exact terminology you should be using when playing <laughs> Tuscany. <laughs> <laughs> In regards to Tuscany, there's another question. What are your favorite mods that you have created? Definitely events and decisions. I'm actually really proud of that. Otherwise, in terms of civs, I think uh, the Chinook, the Gauls, and Tibet. So the three most recently updated ones. <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally. <laughs> Coincidentally. So what about Tibet in particular? We'll start off with Tibet. What do you like about Tibet the most? Honestly, I'm just really, really proud of the code because, like, ability is really simple, right? Just extra faith and food on mountains. But you wouldn't believe the amount of coding that goes into that because I have to cache all the mountains at the beginning of the game. Yeah. And then I have to check every turn whether it belongs to Tibet or not. And then I have to check if they have a religion so I can adjust that. And then because I have uh, this ties into events and decisions, one of the decisions, the Botala Palace, actually gives an extra two gold on mountains. So then I have to code that in as well. As uh, <laughs> If you have the decision enacted, you need to get an extra two gold. You have to consider the Himalayan cavalry, which gives an extra plus one culture. So like, that's a lot of exceptions that goes into the code to make it actually work. The amount of work that modders have to do to fake simplicity. Like you say, the traits on the surface level, they look very, very simple and they're very, very easy to understand. But the amount of coding that is required, you realize that simplicity is just a facade. It's very, very complicated. And Civ 5 is really not that um, easy to mod. Tibet actually has a mountain start. Really? Like, a a wow. hill start. Like the other civs in the games have a hill start instead of a mountain start. Tibet actually coded up a mountain start. It doesn't always relocate Tibet, which is why sometimes it won't actually start near mountains. It has to be directly adjacent to a mountain. And then it looks around for resources and then it assigns a value to the area based on that. And then oh, it okay. just picks the highest value plot and moves Tibet there. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Sounds really complex in terms of how you would have to code it, but wow. Usually when people start in the tundra, they like to re-roll. They, they say, oh, this sucks, and they re-roll. So how do you keep that balanced for a good start location? I actually didn't really have that problem. Tundra and snow regions don't have that many resources, so they're always ranked really low in the way I do it. I take rivers into account, coasts into account, I take strategic and luxury resources and bonus resources into account. So then those regions tend not to get ranked really highly. So most of the time, you won't start there. What about its unique building is the Chorten, and Chorten has a fun ability of accumulating points towards upgrading itself into a great Chorten or something else, and it has a neat little window and an icon on the city screen that you also made. At the time, it tied into something else because at the time, I wanted a way to show like special info in the city screen without having to change the city screen itself because that ruins compatibility with other mods. So I coded something up so that the icon would only show when you enter the city screen. But later, I converted for not so much a mod as much as a framework, MCIS, more city info screen stack. Basically, below the save icon at the top left, I put in a stack that modders can add to. It works sort of like the dipper corner drop down. So you just say you want something and then every time you open the city screen, it'll send an event. They'll give you the instance and you can just do stuff to it, like change the icon, give it a tooltip, blah, 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 blah. It's utilized in a lot of JFD civs now and it's nice because it gives you further information on things that might be already be confusing. 
Yeah, it clarifies a lot of information that is done kind of behind the scenes and that you would have to calculate yourself in case of a lot of vanilla sieves, for example. You didn't have any information of how much you get of every yield as clearly as the MCIS does it. It makes governing cities much easier. It's a very small icon in the top left-hand corner of the screen. All you have to do is hover over and it gives you some very nice specific information. There are a few more civilizations of yours that you have done. I mean, were very different, I thought, because instead of having a unique building as such, there were the um, yields, the side improvements to get the culture and faith. Yeah, I got that idea because the thing is, they aren't buildings as much as rock formations out in the open and like, it doesn't really work as a building. So I just thought it'd be better if I pushed it out into tiles around the city. Yeah. But at the same time, I didn't want to make it a unique improvement, so I decided just to make it a building that reveals improvements. Right. So are those improvement tiles reserved uh, at the start of the game, or are they added when the building is built? They're added when the building is built. It just basically looks for a tile and just pops it there. Ah. I do have a ranking system, so it's more likely to get placed on snow and tundra. So to make actually those tiles useful a bit more. Yeah. Just where you can put farms. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Sami is probably my favorite sieve that um, Sucratech's done, just because I really like those sieves that can utilize um, snow and tundra. It gives them an amazing leg up where other sieves don't. But I think my favorite part about the Sami is definitely the unique unit that has an unpronounceable name, <laughs> in which the, um, it's a range scout replacement that roams around the wilderness looking for animals and can herd them back the nearest city for a short period of time. And it gives a hammer and a food production bonus. Your cities can grow really quickly and you can build wonders really quickly as well. And it's a very unique way of playing the game. Yeah, and those resources do come back on their tiles, right? After they, a short period of time. I think it's the same amount of turns that a trade deal would take. So it changes according to game speed. That's clever. Spotlight on the Chinook as a sieve because it is the latest of secret attack civilizations. One that I didn't see coming, for one. <laughs> and that would also lead to a question what inspires Sucretac to find those civilizations. Honestly, I didn't see the Chinook coming either. The reason I actually did it was because I was playing Europa Universalis and I went to the Pacific Northwest and I noticed there was this group of three ships, the Hyla, the Salish, and the Chinook. I saw that their uh, unique national ideas, they had whale hunting and salmon was the big thing. I <laughs> This is a bit weird, but I really like eating salmon. <laughs> I just love the idea. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> I love the idea of having salmon in the game as a unique luxury resource. I actually was debating between the Salish and the Chinook. I didn't know which to do. At the time, I wasn't aware that Colonial Legacies was planning one. So, But I picked the Chinook just because I like the symbol better. <laughs> <laughs> it's all done to aesthetics, though, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> like people choosing civilizations that look better than others instead of how they play out. Yeah, there's a bit of facetiousness there. And I know I definitely fall into that category. I'm kind of picky with what civs break my emotion and what civs don't. The Chinook, what they do and what they can do, what they have. The leader is Kamkamli. Unique ability, the salmon migrations. Coastal resources are automatically improved. Salmon and orca may periodically migrate to and from cities within range of the coast, being more likely to migrate to cities adjacent to rivers. Where I got the idea is pretty obvious. Salmon. <laughs> <laughs> salmon obviously also still gives uh, food resources as well, the additional food, right? It gives the same as whales, I think. What I really like about it is immediate improvement of coastal resources. This is really powerful early in the game because uh, fishing boats change a lot uh, in terms of growth for early cities. It's a massive improvement. All those plus one foods stack. And when you rush optics and build lighthouses, when you get further food on fish and production from coastal resources, it gets really insane without picking any sea-related pantheon. That's right. It's also worth noting that the unique building is a lighthouse replacement as well, so you do have that incentive to go get that blank house. Yeah. Which is the unique building. Yeah, and this unique building may be built in all cities that have access to any water, so coast, ocean, river, or lake. It's unlocked earlier, so it helps with rushing it, especially. And when it's built next to a river, it increases gold yield of trade routes. So uh, the plank house actually can uh, improve your uh, sea tiles, even if you don't have uh, a coastal city. 
It's very strange going around invading people with um, work boats. Um, <laughs> like, they, they die really quickly, but they're really cheap to produce, so... <laughs> they used to do a lot of exploring in Civ Four with work boats. So the Chinook can do pretty much the same. I've seen uh, the AI just spamming those units. Every game I had, they had like more than 20 of those work boats sailing around everywhere in the coast. <laughs> It's probably my fault because I think I gave them flavors for the trireme plus extra naval improvement thing. So <laughs> the Chinook really want to build those things. <laughs> the resource and revealing of tiles and revealing of resources is a kind of recurring theme in Circuit Tax Civilizations. Like I will keep on pushing the Gauls and the Chinook because they are prime examples of that. <laughs> well, the Chinook have a roaming resource like the Sioux Buffalo, but they have two resources, the Orca and the Salmon, and the Gauls can reveal metal resources. We talked about the Gauls recently in our Barbarian Day invasion kind of thing, where there were four Barbarian ships and the Gauls were, were one of them, but maybe Sucreta could clear some stuff about the coding that went into it. At the start of the game, it looks, scans the map, it looks for the most abundant resource and it catches that. So that's the only resource you can get throughout the game. And basically what happens after that is whenever the Gauls build a mine, it basically checks if it's possible to actually get a resource. If it is, then it also checks the nearest city. It checks how many metal resources already exist in the region and how many mines have already discovered resources. So there's a global number, but that's affected by local values. Sounds a little bit like what happened in Civ 4, where any mine could just randomly get you a resource, you know, iron or gems or gold or whatever. I like that you did that. Yeah, it could easily be an event set at some point. Mm -hmm. I really like that you've kind of not forced the player, but you've given the player in incentive to go out there and do something unique that they usually don't do in a regular game. It's a very, very nice and well thought out design choice. We can send our listeners to modcast number 55 to get their information on the goals and other barbarian sifts. If with one of your civilizations you find that you've got some sort of awesome setup, UA, etc., but the AI for some reason just won't play, do you still go ahead because the human player would be able to take advantage of it? I do. I think a few examples are the command, the Royal Tremere. The AI has absolutely no idea how to use the ability. The basic, basically the ability is when stationed in cities, a domestic trade routes to and from the city give extra production. The AI do not know how to use that. They just pop the great engineer as usual. I suppose another example would be the Maria, which the UA, I did the code for. It was, um, Chakravartin. Upon making peace, receive culture, pretend for positive religion. And the AI will don't know how to use that. They just make more in peace randomly, as they usually do. <laughs> Good old AI. Yeah, I tend to just go with it. I sometimes do code in a sort of a fallback for the AI to use. Like the Sami unit unit, the AI don't know how to use that either. But I basically, I, what I do is I force them to do it whenever they land on a tal that has the herdable resources. Well, at least with forcing AI to do it, we can be sure that something is done in, in character, that the sieve acts in character as it should, even if it's not the most reasonable thing to do at any given point. C5 is a, is a game of being in character, like everyone expects Montezuma to play his character right, and when he's not a warmonger, something's off. Yeah. There must be, from a modern perspective, force the AI to actually take certain actions, rather than make it arbitrary to actually get them to do it. Regarding events and decisions, will we get, at any point in time in the future, ideology-related decisions? Because I remember those were being talked about a long time ago, but it never came to fruition. Like, we have religion-based decisions, but is, is coding, is making ideology-specific decisions possible at all? It probably should be, I mean, because I know for certain the user interface actually can tell which ideology you have, so it should be able to detect that. So, in terms of coding, it's possible. It's just, I just. In terms uh, of motivation. <laughs> yeah, it's a lack of motivation on my part because I've never really liked the modern era. Like anything past industrial yeah. just bores me. So it's, but it's, it's like, up to you to make the modern era more interesting. Exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's this vicious That's, cycle where I don't like the modern cycle. era, so I'm never improving it. <laughs> That's why I, I'm the exact same way. Like, um, I found that the events and decisions are modern kind of stagnated after the industrial era. So it'd be really nice if they did have some more modern sort of events and decisions. 
there's a lot of modded civs and a lot of them don't have added support for events and decisions. Is it kind of um, a possible in the future that those civs that don't have extra support for events and decisions might get some generic decisions that are still somewhat unique? Unique generic decisions. <laughs> unique generic I decisions, do. exactly. So you have like a pool of maybe six random decisions and you can just get random ones each time if, you, if they don't have set support so that they're on par with the... The problem the is I, there isn't actually a way for me to detect whether a save has specific decisions because what happens is that all the saves in the game get their decisions thrown into a pool. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I can actually do that. Although I do hope if I get the motivation and time at some point to do culture-specific decisions. So like right now with the Chinook and the Salish, I am planning a culture-specific decisions for them. When you're designing, say, events and decisions or civs, what sort of um, design choices dictates decisions in the mods that you create? What sort of steps and what sort of um, philosophy do you take into doing such a thing? Normally when I do civs, I research a sieve first, then mm-hmm. I come up with a very rough idea around the sieve. Then I research again just to get the unique units and the unique buildings and their abilities. But I've this time I try to fit them around the idea I already have. Yep. I think I'll go back to Burma on this one. I remember wanting to do Burma right after Tuscany. Because I'm from Thailand, it's a country that neighbors Burma. I already know some stuff. From the start, I wanted to make Burma militaristic because they kept invading Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> they burnt down our capital twice, so I really wanted to make them militaristic. You should have made them really weak just to spite them. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, I knew they had this an amazing history of culture, so I wanted to make them culture mongers, the cultural equivalent of Assyria. I found out that they had a version of the Ramayana, which is a Hindu epic, which exists all over Southeast Asia. Thailand has its own version. So I just decided that works as a unique ability. It doesn't really relate to the Ramayana itself, but I designed the unique ability and just gave it a name that actually works for Burma. For the unique building, the pagan empire was just perfect. They built these temples all over the place, the Paya. This is one of the cases where I actually designed the sieve and fit the buildings around what I designed. Is that something that you usually do? Do you usually do the opposite? Yeah, I usually do the opposite. So like with the Khmer, I already had in mind what I wanted the unique to be and I designed the sieve around it. It's interesting to see how people um, design their sieves, whether they design the sieve first in terms of their unique building. So they just do some research, say, okay, that would be a good unique building and that would be a good unique unit. Then they do some further research and try to fit ability to those units. Or the other way around, which is um, primarily what I do. Not, not many people like doing it this way, but I find it a lot better in which I get the civilization, I do a bit of initial research on it, decide how it plays and then shoehorn in the abilities and the um, unique buildings and the unique units that kind of fit that. So they're not always going to be like the traditional units that everyone would expect, but they kind of fit how the Civ plays. If they're like aggressive and militaristic, or if they're cultural and peaceful or a trading Civ, then I design the uniques around that. I just refine it later, that third round of research. But uh, usually I already have a design in place with what function they're supposed to play, although I don't have it refined. When I did it the opposite way, when I decided what the um, unique units and the unique building was going to be before, I feel that the synergy just wasn't there in terms of cyclical design, in terms of how well the sieve played off its own abilities. So you can have a nice little sort of snowball effect going within your own sieve based on what the unique building and the unique unit start does. It just didn't have that because I, I didn't design the play first. Well, I can say I really designed a lot of sieves. If we are talking about sieves that I've designed, I've designed it with help from uh, either JFD or Puakai or Secret Act. And the sieves I was involved with uh, were Secret Act's goals. I was just listening to a lot of Asterix music and uh, I felt really pumped about... Yes, you do. Yes, yes. I felt really pumped about the concept of having the goals. And the idea was that they were the metal workers that the Romans were learning from. And they had gold mines and everything in the Pyrenees. I just gave the, the initial idea, the initial feel, Secret Act, and Secret Act built upon it. Credit goes to him here. The other sieves were those I just didn't think that vanilla sieves were good representatives of. So France and Poland. Everything about vanilla France was screaming Louis the 14th, and it had Napoleon as the leader. Poland... 
it has powerful uniques, but they represent a few different periods of Polish history. And by working with JFD, I really got into making very saturated, to say, sieves, uh, focused on a single era of its existence. So mostly my design decisions were about flavor and gameplay. Gameplay ideas were handled by both me and JFD kind of equally. So a lot of credit goes to him because with his expertise in code, a lot of this wouldn't be possible. The things that I was interested in historically, they were the reason for designing those sieves. When you go to choose what civilizations you want to create, with Haram, it was more sort of the civilizations that we forgot. With JFD, he really likes his monarchs. For us, we really like our colonial slash pre-colonial civs. What sort of civs interest you? And how do you determine whether or not a civ is worth pursuing? Because obviously you don't work on the civs art without motivation. It's mostly about sentimentality here. I may not really know a lot about civs that I'm working on, but if they have a very distinct kind of historical flavor, that they did something interesting in history, like the Confederate states that are not entirely likable as a civ and as a political entity that existed, but uh, there is something sentimental and romantic about it, I would say. So all this sentimentality, rom- romanticism and uh, historical fantasy kind of thing plays a big role for me choosing civs that I'm interested in. Also, civs I'm interested in are those that have a rich military and naval history, mostly. So if there's a dude in a snazzy uniform to be painted, I will go for it. Right now we have Charles the Twelfth of Sweden, and I did the leader head, so making the king in a uniform was, was really, really fine. And then you, there will be a ship replacement for Gustavus, so making this ship was also super fun. You get the idea. Yeah. And mostly I'm, of course, biased towards European history, because, well, I've grown up here, there's a lot of history surrounding everything in Europe. I may or may not be biased towards colonial uh, <laughs> history. Sukratech may or may not be biased towards <laughs> Southeast Asian since. But, uh, you know, you can, tell. you can tell. But Rob is biased towards ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? You know, like, what? What is that supposed to imply? <laughs> well, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you evil person. <laughs> Mind you, I totally set you up for that. <laughs> I'll let you take the fall for that. What interests me in civs, personally, it's less about the history, because I like history overall, as long as it's before the Great War. Everything after that is more me. So I don't have anything specific. Usually for me, it's more about the play styles. So like, I got really interested with the Sami and the Chinook and the Kalusa as well, because that's new. That They're going to be using marshes, which should be fun. For me, it's a lot less about the particular sieve as much as the play styles they offer. Yeah, as long as it's something unique and wasn't there before. Like, why reiterate the same idea a hundred times? When you go to design civs, you're not exactly interested in name recognition per se, but distinct sort of salient attributes from civilizations in the past. It doesn't matter what they're called or how many people know them. You want to just highlight the fact that they exist in the form of what you do best, modding. That's pretty accurate. I go for the civs with name recognition. <laughs> Many people are kind of highlighting to me the fact that there's some other civs out there that uh, exist that really deserve recognition, but history hasn't been so kind. And a lot of people on the <laughs> Steam comments for the Confederate States, half of the comments were saying that they do not deserve recognition as a civilization because they were abhorrent and they had slaves and everything. But then you forget about Assyria and Egypt that had slaves, so... It's more in recent history. Yeah. It's a story that's worth telling. Like, when I design sieves, I go for the sieves where a story is definitely worth telling. And sometimes that story is not the best story in the world in terms of morals or ethics. But it's a story that needs to be told so we learn not to make those same mistakes again. So we're not glorifying the Boers or the Boers. We're not glorifying the Confederate States or glorifying Nazi Germany. What we're doing is we're highlighting the fact that they exist so that hopefully the same things don't happen again. Speaking of Nazi Germany, Hitler is now in 3D. Do you like that segue? Do you like that one? Yeah. I'm, wow. I'm pretty proud of it. I'm pretty proud of it. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about 3D leaderheads. <laughs> so 3D leaderheads, we've come a long way. Since our last podcast, we've had two new leaderheads uh, within two civilizations that didn't have 3D leaderheads, now have 3D leaderheads. We have Australia and we also have Hitler. Let's just say Hitler is um, 
It's a very, very well-made model. There's not a lot you can say about Hitler. Just the way that he's designed, he says a lot of ironic things. Like, I love the fact that he uses Haley Selassie's animations when, in-game, Haley Selassie is one of the most peaceful people in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but it does make Hitler look very statesman-like. I really do love that picture that uh, JFD used in promoting the mod. And it had um, the diplomatic text that Hitler says, and he says, You are an uncivilized brute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you declare war on him. Very fitting. It's funny because that can be interpreted in one of many ways. Yeah, well, in reports about the personal life of Hitler, he was perceived as a stately cultured man, only fiery mm. when giving speeches. Yes. You could imagine that when he's in the chancery, he will be like, well, looking important and calm. I didn't see the most recent version of Nazi Germany, which JFD updated to great effect. Uh, there's some subtle changes than what it was before, but it's really nice for what it is now. But one of the things that I liked about Nazi Germany the most was the peace theme, the Moonlight Sonata. It was really very, very haunting. The only drawbacks of the lead ahead is no voice acting, but that can easily be remedied. But also the fact that that Moonlight Sonata doesn't exactly fit the, the theme of that um, lead ahead. I really liked the old leader head, and because of the lighting, it just made it look so much more ominous. But uh, maybe that's just me. Well, there was a different background also for Hitler, like a second version of the Brandenburg Gate at night, and it had much better lighting, in my opinion. But well, meeting Hitler in uh, Unter den Linden isn't exactly the kind of thing you would expect from a statesman. It would be like, I don't know, meeting Bismarck in a forest or something like that. <laughs> well, that's what I said to everyone, like with the Henry Parks leader screen, the, the 3D one, the one, first one with voicing. Yeah, a lot of people were uh, lamenting the fact that um, Henry Parks was standing in the middle of a forest. And um, how often was it in Australia in colonial times for men, heavily bearded men, to walk around in the forest? <laughs> and I guess the answer to that question has to be quite often. <laughs> Australia is a land of many things, bearded men being one of them, and tree forests being another one of them. So I thought that was pretty representative of Australia, but I definitely understand the criticism in terms of not placing in with any sort of landmarks or buildings in the background or some sort of um, recognition that, yes, you are in Australia rather than just a green and gold background, which I thought was decent enough. Yeah, but the grass in this leader had is well kept, so we can assume it's a park. <laughs> <laughs> in the evening, you've got the green grass and the golden sun, and, you know, Australia's national colours are green and gold, so I thought, you know, that's pretty representative of what, what I think Australia should be, rather than just kangaroos hopping around everywhere. I think this is a lot more evocative of what Australia is. <laughs> we are now at the total of four leader heads for C5, at least animated ones. Where are the other two? Uh, Mali and... Israel. Oh. When uh, C5 started out, Ekmekler contacted me about my leader heads that I'd done for Civ 3 because we were trying to see whether or not we could port those out because they're models into something like 3DS Max and do animations that way, but it just didn't work out. Oh, that's a pity. It'd be quite interesting, I mean, if you were able to do the model and then do your own animations on the back of that in another program, that would be good, but I think um, it, we're limited pretty much to the Civ 4 method, in a sense, of skinning another character, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Approaching the point where we do understand enough about 3D leader screens to give them unique and custom animations, except that processes like, you know, 7 5 modding in general, extremely arduous. And since we're dealing with 3D leader heads, it's even more arduous and even more tedious in, in terms of actually, you know, making those custom animations work. Civitar, uh, who's been doing units, is also working on another 3D leader head. He does say that custom animations are definitely possible. It's just that the task at hand, it's a long road ahead before something like that becomes easier to do. There's lots of different design choices that go into creating a 3D leader head just as much as creating a 2D leader head. When you have historical leaders, you pretty much can put them in a cliched background, in cliched clothes, and he'll fit. Like Darius, for example. You know where to put him. You pretty much know what language he'll be using. Hmm. Yeah. Mind you, there's a lot of Firaxis civs out there where you would expect them to be in cliché locations. Like, um, for example, Byzantium Theodora, she's in a very cliché location. But then you have other civs where they're just in obscure locations that are not evocative of their country whatsoever. Japan and France as the ones that initially stick out as well. Even Ethiopia. You think Ethiopia and you think of Ethiopia. You don't think of inside of a palace next to a throne. But I guess maybe avoiding clichés isn't exactly the worst thing in the world. Well, Napoleon is kind of in a cliché thing. I think he's on the outskirts of a battlefield somewhere in Europe with all the mist and fog and gun smoke in the background. Yeah.
we had an update to Anno Domini. Anno Domini is a huge mod that's based in the ancient era, going from dawn of time up until more or less the fall of Rome. It has uh, 93 civilizations in it at the moment, all with their own unique abilities and unique buildings, etc. All the buildings, the units, the wonders are all themed in with the ancient world. But there's a full tech tree that's been created for Anno Domini, which is as big as the epic one, only with ancient techs in there. So it's a complete conversion mod. It's a huge undertaking. I've been reading through all the civilizations, what they do and what they have. All the 90 civilizations, looking at the new technology tree and everything, it really has a lot of content that has gone under the radar for many of players. Yeah, I mean, it was quite interesting when I was uh, listening to the guys saying how they um, create civs. I basically looked down uh, JFD's list and more civs and clone legacies and think, how can I use that? Who could do that? Because there's some great abilities and great gameplay. I've been trying to match some of the ancient civs to that gameplay, so there'd be quite a variety of ways of actually playing the mod. In terms of the overall design, I've made resources a bit different to get in some respects, which has made it slightly different gameplay in that, for example, furs can only be got by building a fur trapper. So building that building gives you the resource furs, which is a luxury resource like it is in the main game, but it's not available on the landscape. So instead of one sieve suddenly getting it, you know, the first to get that particular technology and be able to build those suddenly is able to remain fur trader until all of a sudden everybody's got them and they're not worth much. I've also tried to make it so that you can only build certain buildings with certain resources and limit those resources so that you have to make a decision as to which buildings you're going to get. So, for example, a lot of buildings require either limestone or marble which you have to import, or in the case of limestone, there are some deposits which you can use. And basically, you have a range of buildings and also wonders that you could build using those resources, but you have to very much decide which buildings you're going to prioritise. That's just a start. Obviously, there's the website, anodomini.org.uk. I made a conscious effort to keep the uh, website updated every time I do an update to the mod so that players can actually check there for a quick reference. I just thought that would be quite useful rather than constantly answering various questions. It's all there. And it's an easy uh, reference guide, I think, as well for people. Yeah, it's very clear and it's very concise. I wanted to say the same thing. It's very easy to navigate as well. Thank you. Just as a repository of all advanced information about the mod, I think that the size of your mod and the scope pretty much validates that. You did your own sub form as well. <laughs> well, I thought of that, but do you know what? I don't get that much response on the Siphonatics to do that. In that, yes, people are responding and giving some feedback on the game, but it's only like about maybe three or four posts a day, which in some respect isn't that much. If that was in a whole sub forum, it would look very unused. Can you see what I mean? But it could also have the effect of the uh, community balance patch, which when it moved over to a new sub forum, attracted a whole new flurry of activity. It was because discussion was essentially split up into lots of different topics, so you can discuss lots of different topics at hand. Because uh, what happens in just single thread topics about big projects like Anno Domini or even, you know, more civs or JFT civilizations, there can only be one topic at one time. People are kind of bogged down, essentially, in talking about that one topic. And if people are prodded to talk about particular other things, they probably would. So it's something maybe to consider. Yeah, I might consider that. Thank you. I have a hard time choosing the civilization I want to play as. There are two possibilities. I will either choose a civilization I'm familiar with, like Sumer or, I don't know, Carthage or something like that, or I will spend two hours in a random number generator trying to decide the civilization for me and not agreeing with the random number <laughs> generator and ruling it for, <laughs> for, for well, eternity. You know, remember as well is that the civilizations might not be quite as you remember them. Even the established ones like Carthage, Byzantium, don't always follow how they are in the epic game. Yes, of course. I sometimes don't understand them, because I don't understand your personal preferences regarding some, some civilizations. Like, for example, Armenia has its unique ability changed. And what would be the philosophy behind uh, adjusting many of the unique abilities and, and well, components? I couldn't get Armenia's ability to work properly. As much as I like JFD civs, 
I just didn't like that ability. Probably because my gameplay style is to get religions and to go down sort of a religious path. So maybe that had something to do with it. They also fit in very nicely in the uh, Polish trait of the free social policy when you advance the next era. It just yes. seems to yes. fit in nice with the uh, Tetradrachum. That was the reason, really. I do play the various sibs, and I kind of judge whether or not people would actually like to play them within Nano Domino, and it just didn't quite work properly for me with the original trait. That's not to say, of course, that other people wouldn't find it interesting. I have considered moving that back to JFD's version, so that's still a possibility. The latest Civ is the uh, Masagetai, which was recently released by... Um, that's his CEO, I think. With that particular one, I decided to do a new leader head because I do like creating leader heads. I also like their Step Axeman, so I put that in, but something that was different to the other Civs within Anno Domini. And uh, the gold mine I put in, which just slightly different to the gold merchant that, that was in the original, because again, it was fitting into Anno Domini. The trait is the Shoshone trait, because they had quite a large amount of territory, the Masagetai, so that for me worked better than the trait for Anno Domini. And of course, when you're doing a mod like this, you can actually reuse those traits because when you guys are creating civs, you've got to do something that's completely different because people will be playing the epic game and the um, civs that came with Braxis, whereas this one obviously takes out all the civs that wouldn't be in that particular era. So plenty of traits to reuse uh, and indeed plenty of building effects to reuse. But of course, I've also included a number of mods, not least the Help and Play one that Framed Architect did. Yes. And I have put in decisions to go with the events that went with uh, Anno Domini. So I've chosen a number of the core decisions that Sucretat did, and I've chosen a few of the Civ specific ones and made those generic as well. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, wow. That's something I'm really glad to hear. If you say that some Civ specific decisions are converted into generic ones, well, all the better, all the merrier. Could you give an example of which were converted? Oh, yeah, for example, Babylon's Observatory, because that's just creating uh, an observatory in the capital, so that was very easy to be uh, a generic one. The other one that I thought was quite interesting was a series, one of their decisions, Automatic Resettlement Orders. It sorts out the landscape once you've um, attacked a city, it clears the landscape around it. Yes, yes. One of the things that struck me with this was that although I'm creating a situation where civilizations have quite a few decisions that they could make, again, we're talking limited resources in terms of the magistrates, so they could never make all of them. Yes. If I'm creating maybe two or three more, I've got 13 at the moment, which is unlucky for some. But I thought if I've got somewhere in the region of 16 to 20 decisions that everyone could make that would suit your gameplay or civilization or whatever. And, and I kind of like that idea. That's why I did the buildings with limited limestone, for example, or, you know, a certain amount of marble. You had to choose which buildings you would have. So I think there's nothing worse than a game where you can build everything in every city or make every decision because you got to a point where you could. When you're having to make those decisions, it makes it a little bit more interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah. Will the new version of Anno Domini be updated with a recent update to Health and Plague? That fix some things? Yes, yes, it's already in. That's great. The uh, Move Capital mod and Reforestation mod, those have had updates as well, so I've put in the updates. I've also put in some new city-states just to add to the variety with that. I'm looking forward to it. Good. Do you worry about um, when you're creating Anno Domino, how this massive sort of conversion could be seen as overwhelming? And do you kind of take that into account when you're promoting it? When you want people to play Anno Domino, I'd rather people just go head first and not know exactly what to do and kind of learn as the game progresses. Or would you rather them kind of study up and accustom themselves to the world of the mod first? Like, what would you recommend people do? I, I think that's pretty much up to them, to be honest with you. The philosophy I have is that I'm creating the game that I want to play, and I'll share it with everyone else. So if they want to play it as well, great. I know I've been pretty much a lone wolf with the, in, in terms of the design of the mod, although I have taken, obviously, plenty of artwork, etc. on all of you guys, <laughs> as well as others. But I've been the ultimate user in that respect. I've managed to make things fit. But I think people need to understand that it's designed to play without any other mods involved because 
on Steam, on Sif Fanatics, and forever getting, oh, this mod doesn't work, this mod, there's a problem with this mod, it's all bugged. But it turns out that people aren't following the instructions, which is just to play it as a standalone game. <laughs> the thing is, for example, just taking help and play, or taking events and decisions, that is designed for the whole game. So it's going to have buildings and text and everything it's going to refer to just aren't in Anno Domini. So I've had to rejig those so that it matches the, the scope of the mod. Hopefully, people stand that this time. Since you were involved in modding since, well, at least Civilization 3, are there any ideas from older versions of Anno Domini or from your other mods from Civilization 3 and 4 that were ported or translated into this version for Civ 5? The whole thing started off as a Civ 3 mod, and that mod went to completion. It had two three different versions, and of course, there were Tech Tree in particular was already there. What's People forget, I think, um, I think I've said this before, when creating a new Civ, for example, is that go back and have a look to see what people did in Civ 3 and Civ 4. The city lists are going to be the same. History hasn't changed. The Civilpedia entry, that'll probably be okay. And some of the ideas, people have already done this research on other versions of Civ. Why not take a look at what they've done and, and you can get some ideas from there? So in respect of a lot of the leaders that were in Civ 3, I'd already done the research, already done the Civ entries, so it it was a good start for me. Of course, but how about uh, like unique abilities of some units or buildings that exist or something like that? Was anything specific translated from older versions? Yeah, I mean, the the thing is, when Civ 3 was going and before Civ 4 was even thought of, I came out with Civ-specific buildings within Civ 3 and that hadn't been done before. Yes, it only was added in Civ 4 and later on. That's right, that came later on. Now, I do know that Fraxis played Anno Domini version 3, so you never know. They might have just got that idea first. (laughs) Yeah. But I doubt that. I'm just trying to think back. I think it's more the tech tree that kind of picked up because there they had different tech trees dependent on the civilization that you were playing. I built it so that there were different tech trees and different paths you could go down. But there are quite a few similarities. I think we're reaching a point now where all the elements are in the mod. It's just a bit of tidying up now. Call in today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44121-288-7659. That's 44121-288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. You can Skype us at the Polycast or email us at the Polycast at gmail.com. For more information on Modcast, our sibling shows Polycast, Revcast, Tiffcast and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. I miss the Civ 3 days where what would happen there and how it's different modding these days is that someone would create the a leader head, somebody else would create a unit and so on and building somebody else. And then people would be able to then create the civs based on the resources they already had. Yeah. Uh, whereas now, whilst the art is often done by other people and some of the coding done by people who aren't necessarily connected to that person that's, that's doing the civ, everything waits until the civ's released. Sometimes it can be a while, which is a shame, because the art and the coding's already done. Yeah, it kind of depends on the person who's making it, yeah. and uh, modding nowadays is a lot more centralised than it used to be. There's lots of teams in Civ, and um, all of these teams are very insular and very competitive, and we try not to step on each other's toes, but inevitably we always are. But there are those... Um, <laughs> members of the community that do create their own assets for other people to use. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting observation. One of the reasons why I mentioned it, I mean, I was online with Jan about a week ago, and he pointed out there was one or two icons that he created for other people that had not got used. There's one that I'm using now as a chakra thrower, and there was one mm. as, a, as, as like a naval spearman for Greece. And that art has been around for a year or two now and not been used, so it was just a shame that it was going without being used, so to speak. So he kindly let me uh, use them for my mod. But it's just a shame sometimes because there must be other art and coding that would be useful to someone but she never sees the light of day. Well, before custom sieves started to get popular, 
in terms of creating them. You had a whole bunch of people that did exactly what you're talking about oh, as yeah. they did in the um, Civ 3 days. So we have all those converted Civ 4 units just sitting around in the download section that lots of people can use. If we started like we did from the beginning, then modding would just not be the same. Yeah, well, an- another example would be from Civ 4 where you have a few big libraries of leader heads that are just waiting to be picked by anyone. But judging a lot of those leader heads, they are mostly simple refurbishments of existing leaders. Or, or there's a cape added in, or there's a beard added in, and there's a new leader already and uses uh, existing animations and doesn't have to be voice acted. So that was really easier than doing leader heads now. There's a lot of work to make a two-dimensional image compelling. But I think that's all for today. We covered a fair amount of content. We had a great guest with Secret Act. Yeah. Was that a clue? Were we supposed to clap? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you joined the uh, stock market closing. <laughs> what an interesting stock market that would be. Just a different percussion instrument every day. Thanks everyone for joining us for Modcast number 56. Me, Jan Vruta, was joined by... T. Pangolin, also known as Jess. Rob R.A. Tex F.T. Alpha Shard. It's a good act. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for putting up with us. And I hope we'll meet next time. I think he's on the inside of an airplane cabin. <laughs> yeah. I can write it if you want, but um, someone else can do it if they really want to. I'll just do it. That was my subtle way of getting someone else to do it, but it didn't work. So. <laughs> well, no, I, I was under the uh, impression that you said you are typing it right now, so... <laughs> oh, sorry, no, no, um, I'm not, but I am going to do it anyway just to guilt trip you so I can get something off you later, I don't know, so I can morally one-up you. <laughs> what is that sound? Pardon? What sound? I hear it. I don't know, it's just something like a vacuum cleaner. I don't know. Vacuum? No. Maybe it's me scratching my beard. <laughs> me breathing. <laughs> I think it's my computer. <laughs> well, don't say Minecraft uses so much memory. <laughs> At least those are no sheep sounds. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Uh, Do we want to get started? Yeah. Did I miss anything interesting? Yes. No. Nothing of (laughs) importance. Mind you, I don't actually play beyond the industrial era. If I'm in a position where I'm already winning, it's no longer fun and I just quit. If I'm too far behind, then I just quit as well. So (laughs) it's actually fair that I actually get into the modern era anyway. (laughs) My games usually crash into Renaissance, so I (laughs) I don't play beyond that point. (laughs) If you've seen a beret, it's just really a big, 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 big artificial pond. It's not representative of the Khmer's like architectural ability because their temples and their palaces are so much more impressive. Yeah, but why have that when you can have a large artificial pond? <laughs> Come on, like. I really wanted a France that has uh, a set of aggressive militaristic uh, things instead of a mishmash. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, just really quickly. I think um, I think your mic's kind of cutting out a bit. Or the um the quality of it is kind of gone a bit awkward. Oh, again? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, how is it? All right, Rob. I think only one thing remains with Anno Domini because if somebody will be just joining us with Modcast and doesn't know what Anno Domini is, maybe you could describe it shortly what the mod is in general and what it does. So Dan can and put Dan it... Dan will have to put this at the beginning, probably. Yes, yes. <laughs> I will have to find the time to make the art for Pergamon, because it's the fourth Civ that will be added. Has that been announced? Yes, yes it was. Damn it. I thought we had a mod cast first. No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Just going back to uh, the times, I do walk some tired in the evening or early, very early morning, which might fit. I don't know. We'll see.
What is it? Dinner's ready. <laughs> the gong. It's from the Philippines. I've got a flute around here too, but it's four in the clock in the morning and I probably just woke up half the household. Congratulations. It was worth it. <laughs> Did you actually get around to doing a modcast uh, at some point? You know that, don't you? I think he actually went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really bad for Dan. And? Alright, then we'll copy paste uh, from the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) Alpha shot. (laughs) Yes. We're doing our closing statement. You joined us today. (laughs) Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And most of all, Commiserations to uh, Dan for having to edit us. (laughs) Record date March 14th, 2015. Civilization 4 and 5 sound clips, copyright Take 2 Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.